Hi friends, welcome to another edition of Corporations Class Online. Um, today a new topic, this is Class 21, and we're going to talk about um, some special fiduciary duties that apply in the mergers and acquisitions context, um, specifically when a, uh, a takeover is unfriendly or hostile as we say. Uh, just to refresh, we've mentioned it many times in this class, there are two basic fiduciary duties that go way back into antique history uh, in corporations law, and those are the duties of care and loyalty. Um, <clears throat> those were really the only two fiduciary duties, broadly speaking, that existed in corporation law until probably uh, the mid 20th century. Um, a few others have uh, evolved. We're going to talk about two of them that apply in this unfriendly takeover context, and those are uh, what we're going to uh, we will come to know as the Unical rule and um, the Revlon rule, also sometimes called duties, the Unical duty and the Revlon duty. Uh, there's one other fiduciary duty that we'll talk about later in the semester, um, and that's known as the Donahue Wilkes duty, um, and that is a special rule for closely held corporations, but we'll get to that later. Um, okay, well, so today's topic then is going to be to introduce um, the Unical and Revlon duties. Uh, they're fairly complicated. The cases in which they come up are complicated, so we're going to take two full class periods to work through this. Um, this is also going to be an opportunity for me to lay out some background, some context about these duties, because in part they evolved through um, <clears throat> the development, uh, uh, I mean they, they evolved along with developments in um, <clears throat> the real world uh, corporations' behavior and real-world financial markets. Um, and in particular, there were changes in the way that mergers and acquisitions um, occurred, both the, the frequency of them, the size of them, and their nature. Um, and so the law evolved along with them, or at least the, that was the court's uh, goal. Courts attempted to um, keep up with changes in the real world by modifying uh, the fiduciary rules that they applied. Okay, so some background things. Um, what we're going to be talking about for this class period and the next one, uh, again, are unfriendly takeovers. Um, basically, what we mean when we say an unfriendly takeover is a tender offer. So we've talked about this before. A tender offer is um, like any other change in control transaction in the sense that if it goes through, if it's successful, control of the corporation will um, usually wind up in the hands of the tender offeror, the person or the corporation attempting to buy uh, a controlling stake in some target firm. Uh, the big difference, though, is that the other control transactions that we talked about each involved uh, proposals that would first be voted upon by at least one board of directors um, and at least one body of shareholders. And following those approvals, the transaction would... Um, uh, would occur, it would occur by operation of law. Be because of the approval of the shareholders, it would simply be made to happen as a matter of law and shares would, trans shares would change hands in exchange for consideration. Tender offer is different. Um, there's no shareholder vote, there's no tender off, uh, no board votes at all. Instead, the tendering, the tender offer or the person or uh, almost always corporation that's attempting to buy the target company simply goes to the shareholders directly and offers to buy their shares. Um, okay, so it's more complicated than I'm going to make it sound, mainly for the reasons that we set out in the very beginning of today's reading assignment, which are, uh, which is that um, tender offers are regulated by federal securities law, and those rules get kind of hairy. Uh, it's complicated, um, and they, those rules impose a lot of structure on how tender offers have to be conducted. Um, but we can talk about it in simpler terms. As far as we're concerned, a tender offer really is just an open market purchase uh, in which the tender offeror announces to the shareholders of some target firm that uh, it would like to buy their shares. Okay, so there's a couple of details that are important because you might be wondering, well, how do you how do you organize all this if we're talking, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of shares, as is often the case in publicly traded firms? Um, how do you organize all that? And here are, here are a few thoughts. Um, first of all, the tender offeror um, isn't going to go individually and speak with or try to communicate directly with every individual shareholder. In other words, in, in, instead, um, a public announcement is made. 
And in that public announcement, the tender offeror will state terms at which it will buy shares. Um, <clears throat> and it will say, uh, typically a price, uh, describe the nature of the consideration, and it will say how many shares the tender offeror wants to acquire. Also, the offer will be made conditional because first of all, the tender offerer doesn't want to buy any shares at all unless it can get the minimum number that it needs. And typically, the tender offeror um, will either be trying to get just bare majority ownership so that they have control of the board or all the shares. So typically, uh, the tender offerer will say, uh, I hereby uh, um, invite, solicit sales of such and such a number of shares of XYZ Incorporated if, such a, if that minimum number of shares is tendered on such and such a date, I will pay the stated consideration for each individual share. Uh, and that's it. Um, now, uh, one final detail is that a lot of times tender offer or offers are oversubscribed, meaning more people want to sell shares than the tender offeror actually wants. If you only want 50% of the shares and let's say 75% offer their shares, that may be more than you want. So you can also make, and the tender offerers always make their offers um, conditional in, uh, in the following sense. They say, I, uh, I will buy shares at the following price if a minimum number are tendered on such and such a date. And moreover, if more are tendered than I need, I will purchase them pro rata from every shareholder who offers. So uh, if if the thing is oversubscribed, he, uh, the tender offer only wanted 50%, 75% attempt to sell. Well, the tender offer will buy those 50% shares and uh, uh, basically will buy two thirds of the shares offered by every single person to make sure that everybody gets to sell an equal percentage of their shares into the tender offer. Okay, so that's basically how it works. <clears throat> None of that is crucial to today's class. Um, we just need to understand basically how tender offers work. The reason we say that these things are unfriendly is that they don't require the participation of the target firm's board. Uh, so the management of the target firm doesn't have to have anything to do with the tender offer. And generally speaking, they ain't happy about it at all. When there's a tender offer, um, the management of the target firm will typically at least be worried and oftentimes openly hostile to it for various reasons. Uh, but we all tend to think the, the biggest reason is that um, the when tender offers go through and the acquirer gets control, the first thing it does is it fires all the managers. So the board is out of their board positions. The management is all out of their jobs. So um, management of firms tend to oppose these things pretty pretty vigorously. Um, all right, and that finally brings us to the real issue that is at the heart of our class today, which is that opposition by management tends to put them in a fairly uh, sharp conflict with their own shareholders. And that is because when there's a tender offer that is meant to secure control, then just like in any other change in control transaction, there tends to be a control premium, and it can be big and big and fat and massive and very desirable to um, uh, target firm shareholders, uh, as we know, uh, takeover premia tend to run about 50%. They've often run 50%. Uh, right, right now, on average, they're running about 30%. So you can get a big fat payout on your stock, much much better than you could really expect uh, through mere uh, uh, distribution of dividends or uh, capital appreciation in the short term. So shareholders tend to like takeovers a whole lot. Management tends not to like them. Uh, and that puts the management in um, something of a conflict of interest with um, their own shareholders. Uh, and this has been recognized by the courts for a pretty long time. Um, okay, uh, having said all that, it isn't actually necessarily the case that tender offers are always hostile. Sometimes management is okay with a tender offer. Um, and occasionally tender offers occur in which the management recommends the deal to their shareholders. Um, <clears throat> that doesn't usually happen, though, for this simple reason. If management uh, and some buyer want to arrange a change in control, it's usually quite a lot preferable for all of them, for everyone's interests, 
to organize the um, transaction as a friendly deal in which the target management <coughs> um, and board works with the acquirer um, to pull off either a merger or a share exchange or some other friendly transaction. There, there are several reasons for this. Um, first of all, um, in a tender offer, it's unclear, it will typically be unclear to the acquirer um, exactly what price has to be paid to make sure that a majority of the shares are acquired. If you price the thing too low, you won't get enough shares and your tender offer might fail. Uh, if you price it too high, you're just wasting money. So the tender offerer is in a difficult position of trying to pick the right price and hoping they get it right. Um, in a negotiated deal, on the other hand, um, when management recommends a deal to their own shareholders, there's a pretty good chance it'll go through. Um, <clears throat> and all you have to do is convince a bare majority of the shares to vote in favor of it. Um, and something we've hinted at quite often in this class, we've never talked about it in too great a detail. But remember, when there's a shareholder meeting, shareholders nominally get to show up and vote their shares. All right. But remember this thing we've talked about called a proxy. A proxy is an agreement between a, vote, a, a shareholder and some other person authorizing that other person to vote their shares. When there's a special shareholder meeting to vote in favor, uh, you know, vote on a plan of merger, just like any other shareholder meeting, the management, uh, at least in publicly traded companies, will solicit, as we say, solicit shareholder proxies before the meeting, um, and they make those solicitations of all shareholders. So they will ask every single shareholder in the company to give a proxy to management, authorizing management to vote their shares. So generally speaking, when management of a publicly held company is going into a shareholder meeting, everybody knows how the deal is going to go. It's going to go the way that management wants, because typically management will secure enough proxies um, that it can more or less control the outcome. All right. So if you do a friendly deal with um, an acquirer and a target board, and there is a negotiated merger agreement, which includes a negotiated price, um, target management will recommend the deal to the shareholders um, and likely will get a substantial number of proxies, perhaps enough um, to single-handedly make the deal go through. Okay, so if you're going to do a tender offer, unfortunately, you can't do all that. You don't know what the price is going to be. Approval is definitely not a foregone conclusion, so you're probably going to bid more. Tender offer prices tend to go higher. The, uh, the, the deal consideration will be higher just because the tender offer has to make sure that it gets enough shares. A couple of other reasons this is more expensive and more risky. First of all, tender offers, it's, uh, there's no guarantee they're going to go through. Tender offers fail all the time, and so there might be a big, expensive, disruptive effort on the part of the takeover proponent, uh, which then fails. A third reason uh, that tender offer is really not as desirable as a friendly deal is that um, when you make a tender offer, uh, by definition, you can't do it in secret. All right. Uh, and that's for a couple of reasons. First of all, obviously, you have to communicate to the public shareholders if, if it's a publicly held corporation anyway. You have to make a public announcement. Moreover, those federal rules that I mentioned, the federal regulatory requirements that surround takeovers, the federal securities regulation oversight of tender offers imposes some, some uh, waiting periods. And so you basically can't do a tender offer any faster than a, about 20 days under federal law. So if you do a tender offer, uh, at least if the target is a, is a publicly held corporation, um, you're giving the whole world a, about three weeks notice at a minimum of what you have in mind. And, you know, something we've talked about a little bit in this class is um, why the parties to a negotiated deal might try to keep it secret. Um, you keep it secret because if one company desires to buy another company, it sort of follows, it, it seems to stand to reason, that the acquiring company thinks that that uh, target is undervalued. Think about this. Publicly traded companies, at least, are valued constantly. Every day, securities exchanges are constantly updating their estimates of the value of a given firm. The stock price of a company on any given day is the stock market's estimate of the value of that company on a share-by-share -share basis. 
If the stock market is efficient, if it's good at incorporating information, and generally speaking, we think it's really, really good, perhaps uniquely good among all markets. But if it's good at that, um, you shouldn't be able to buy a company at its given stock price and make it any more profitable than it already is. Okay, You shouldn't be able to make it more valuable than it already is. At least that's one uh, point of view. A lot of people believe that. Well, not only do takeover proponents pay uh, the going stock price, hoping that they'll be able to make something out of that target company, they pay huge premiums. So they're betting that they can run that company much more profitably than it's currently being run because the market is assuming that that company isn't, uh, just isn't worth as much as the takeover proponent thinks it is. All right? Here's the problem. When you buy a company like that, you at least when you make the offer, you're broadcasting to the whole world that you think the company is a, is a bargain. It's a steal. Uh, it's undervalued. Anybody who would buy it at the current price and get control of it could make a substantial profit by running it better. And so that's like a little uh, a little red flag. It tells the whole rest of the world what you think about this company being a bargain. And uh, sure enough, it does sometimes invite uh, competing offers. So everybody really wants to avoid that. Another thing is shareholders know that um, companies, uh, that control of a company is worth a lot. And... Um, a problem happens when a tender offer is made. During that three-week period, that three-week minimum period that the tender offer, excuse me, has to be open, sometimes the shareholders will start, uh, you know, talking, or analysts at least will talk about the company. News will develop. Uh, suggestions sometimes are made that the company actually is worth more than even the tender offer thinks. And sometimes the price can, can jack up a little bit, and the tender offer has to wind up, winds up having to raise their price to get it. Sometimes a competing bid will come in, two different companies are bidding for the same target, and they're raising their prices against each other, and prices go haywire. We're going to see that in a couple of, couple of cases today. So um, publicity is not the tender offeror's friend, in other words. The acquiring company's friend is not uh, publicity. So um, you can do a deal and keep it much quieter if you can negotiate it in a friendly manner than if you have to go uh, to public markets. <clears throat> so... Um, that's the lay of the land. You have this process of tender offer, which tends to be hostile, tends to be done without the acquiescence of the target management for a variety of practical reasons. Um, but it's the only way you can get a company if the target management won't work with you. Um, if you do that hostile tender offer, though, you can expect target management to um, throw up roadblocks in your way. Okay, that finally brings us to where um, today's legal rules come in, uh, and specifically, um, the courts, uh, starting in about uh, the 1960s, realized that there was a tension here. If target managements were throwing up roadblocks, well, that might be um, at odds with the interests of their own shareholders, and perhaps treating their behavior simply under the very deferential traditional fiduciary uh, duties, and in particular, the traditional business judgment rule, uh, might not be appropriate, might not protect the shareholders well enough. And so we wind up with the rule that we get in the case we're going to talk about in a second called uh, Chef. Okay. Anyway, before we get to Chef, though, there's one last background thing I want to talk about. And that is a concept that has come up before, but we need to talk about it a little bit more. Um, and like I said, we're going to have a couple of digressions today on things that I, I find interesting, at least, and I hope you do, too. Um, this is an area of the law in which it's sort of uncommonly helpful uh, to understand some background um, ideas and some background institutions. So the first one that we're going to talk about is the so-called market for corporate control. Okay. Okay, so this was uh, an academic uh, creation associated, I mean, a whole bunch of people wrote about it, but associated especially with this fellow, Henry Manny. Um, um, it originates in the early 1960s. Manny wrote his famous article in 1965. Um, and this was um, one of the, the characteristic uh, contributions of the so-called law and economics movement. The idea of the market for corporate control is that um, ownership of control of a corporation is just like any other asset, and that means that it can be bought and sold in a market. Uh, and markets uh, exist for valuing things. So if somebody, you know, if somebody thinks that something is worth more than its current owner, uh, 
uh, they might go and offer a higher price to that owner um, <clears throat> than the owner uh, thinks it's currently worth. So uh, assets move from uh, uh, people who own things to people who uh, value them more highly. And the idea is, well, that must be a good thing because if somebody values it more highly, that implies that they can put it to better use than its current owner. Um, again, with a lot of the ideas we talk about in this course, these things are these things are pretty freighted with political um, um, weight. Um, and let's let's just try to you know, put that aside. And remember, this is something, in fact, that the courts believe, whether whether you particularly uh, believe it or not. I I personally have my my fairly serious doubts about this whole idea, but it was nonetheless influential with the courts. All right. So the reason this was significant to the law is. If there really is a market for corporate control and it tends to work out for the best, like it tends to get assets into the hands of people who value them the most highly and can make the best use of them, well, we should then be cautious about the efforts of incumbent managers uh, to keep companies from being sold, including uh, um, efforts to keep them from being uh, taken away from incumbent management by hostile takeover. Um, all right, um, let's just think about this for one uh, more second, why might it be that a takeover proponent would value control more highly than the incumbent management or the incumbent shareholders? And the answer is, well, it stands to reason that they think they can run the company more profitably. All right, And that's an argument for why takeovers are a good or a healthy thing. If, um, if a person can run a company more efficiently, well, that's kind of better for everybody, um, at least on a very uh, aggregate um, abstract level. It's not so great oftentimes for the workers uh, and uh, uh, other people, other, uh, you know, community constituents who are involved in a given corporation, because uh, oftentimes people lose jobs or uh, factories are closed down, businesses are moved out of state, whatever. Um, but at least on an aggregate, aggregate sort of social level, the argument is that on the whole, it's better if businesses are in the hands of people who can run them the best. All right. Well, just as this sort of theoretical uh, thinking about the market for taking corporate control was uh, taking shape, a case arose in Delaware um, called Chef versus Mathis. Uh, this is on page 751 in your book. Case reached the Delaware Supreme Court in 1964. Uh, this wasn't exactly a tender offer. Like there was, uh, this case never actually got to the point at which uh, the takeover proponent actually made a public announcement. Um, seeking shares, but it was like a tender offer, and it definitely seemed to be a case in which um, events were leading towards what would have been a tender offer. Um, um, interesting thing about this case, um, there's a there's sort of a background social history here. Now, nowadays we just sort of take uh, mergers and acquisitions and hostile takeovers as relatively common things. We're all familiar with them. They happen all the time. And um, while they're politically controversial in various ways, um, they don't seem especially out of the ordinary. Things were actually quite different at one time in America. Um, and in particular, prior to about the middle, middle 20th century, hostile takeovers were simply not very common. And that's for a few reasons. Um, but, but the bigger picture idea here is Hostile takeovers were not common because they were socially disapproved of, and in particular, they were socially disapproved of within the corporate community, the corporate and financial community. Um, something to understand is that um, if you were going to take over somebody's company, um, you needed a lot of money to do it. And generally speaking, uh, nobody had that kind of money. Individuals didn't have great big gobs of money laying around that they were willing to, to risk uh, by putting it all into one big acquisition. Uh, same with corporations. They weren't going to just use their own cash to go out uh, and buy a corporation um, away from its owners. So if you were going to do it, you had to get the money from somewhere. And generally speaking, people went to investment banks. All right. Now, remember, we've talked about investment banks before. Remember, an investment bank isn't quite like the ordinary commercial bank where you have a savings account and take out loans and things like that. Instead, it's a financial firm that oversees a big pile of money, which it uh, uh, invests with corporations. It gives to corporations to fund uh, their big transactions. So uh, the example where we've seen this before is the investment bank operating as the underwriter of an initial public offering of stock. So remember, 
when a corporation first sells stock to the public, the way it works is the corporation, which you see on the left there, will um, uh, secure an underwriter. Uh, rather, it'll secure an investment bank to act as its underwriter. And the way this works is the underwriter will give the corporation a, typically a lump sum of money <clears throat> in exchange for all the securities that the corporation is going to issue in its IPO. The underwriter then goes out and markets those securities to investors who pay the underwriter uh, cash. And the underwriter makes its, its income by um, uh, earning a little bit of spread, or earning a little bit in terms uh, uh, in the difference between the price that it sells the securities to the public at and um, the securities at which, uh, or rather the price at which it paid the corporation for the securities. So here's the thing. Um, traditionally, Investment bankers <clears throat> and the managers of larger corporations, uh, and this is true today as well, um, they're from the same walks of life by and large. They're a smallish community. They know each other. Uh, they come from similar backgrounds, and they have similar attitudes towards how things should be done. That really was quite a lot more true uh, in the mid-20th century. Um, um, and uh, the relevance of all of this is that there was a norm against interfering with another fellow's business. It wasn't gentlemanly. It was not the sort of thing that was done. Uh, you didn't take over some other man's corporation uh, without his permission. Um, and that was not only the view of, of the people who were running the corporations, it was also the view of the bankers who were in charge of lending the money. So thing is, if you were an upstart, an usurper, you weren't uh, part of the in crowd, uh, and you wanted to go and take somebody's company away from them, that would have been hard to do because the people who had big piles of money that could help you do it, uh, they just wouldn't do business with, wouldn't do business with you, um, and so it couldn't be done. All right, so that's kind of the background to this case, um, Jeff versus Mathis. Uh, you have this fellow Merrimount, um, and Merrimount was definitely that sort of uh, outsider, the usurper who uh, uh, wasn't really part of the in crowd, but he was in the business of uh, uh, trying to interfere with other people's businesses, and um, that's what he tried to do in this case. So uh, the facts are more complicated uh, than, than we really need to delve into, but in a uh, short version is um, Merrimount was interested in... Um, at least acquiring shares of this company, Holland Furnace, a publicly traded company. Uh, and indeed, he did personally buy some shares. Initially, he did it secretly. Uh, again, there's a reason for that. It's better to get your foothold in the company as quietly as you possibly can before you tip anybody off and the price starts going up. Um, the insiders at Holland Furnace, uh, once they discovered this, weren't happy about it. Uh, they were worried about this guy. They had fears about his... Um, his intentions. Um, we edited out some of the facts. Um, um, it's interesting to know that this uh, case arose sort of against the backdrop of the Korean War um, uh, and the return of GIs uh, to America. Uh, and Holland Furnace was in the business of selling um, furnaces to people. Uh, and the thought was that the returning GIs were going to buy a lot of houses and put lots of furnaces in and upgrade their houses and all that. So business should have been good. Um, thing is, <clears throat> Holland, for, Holland Furnace had been on somewhat hard times, perhaps, as a result of the war. Um, and importantly, Holland had this, uh, this approach to doing its business, which involved owning a, or um, maintaining an in-house sales force. So it had its own fleet of in-house in uh, salespeople. Uh, who I guess would go door-to-door -to -door, or at least would do the direct outreach to potential buyers for the company's products. Well, it came to light. Uh, insiders learned that uh, Merrimount was buying up some stock. They noticed that because there were unusual uh, unusual activity in the stock on the, the stock exchange. And so they made inquiries. They discovered that Merrimount was behind it. Um, uh, and uh, uh, for what it's worth, he was doing that Um he was making the purchases through a corporation that he controlled called Motor Products Corporation, but that's not really very important. He was the moving force. Um, so Merrimount approaches the management at Holland. And uh, like I said, this is the kind of thing you do. If you want to get control of a company, you typically will make friendly overtures first because if a friendly deal can be had, it's really better for everybody. You get a cheaper price. You don't have a big fight. You don't have a bunch of publicity. You don't have a huge distraction that uh, takes up everybody's 
time and takes them away from running the businesses. Um, and something that uh, Marymount made clear was he thought that running this in-house staff of salespeople was, uh, was not a good idea. It was, it was expensive, it was uh, inefficient, and it would be better to outsource <clears throat> um, the sales to third parties, maybe sell uh, products through uh, franchisees or through independent uh, distributors, something like that. Okay, well, this is relevant to the legal, legal issues in the case. The, the incumbent management at Holland claimed, at least, that <clears throat> they were concerned for the health of the company. Uh, they thought that Marymount represented a uh, threat to the health of the company um, because that staff of in-house salespeople uh, came, became aware of Marymount's presence, excuse me, and feared that he would, uh, he would disrupt the company and perhaps, uh, lay them all off. So it was hurting the company, they claimed, uh, and it was necessary, therefore, to make him go away. So, um, very interesting thing happened here. Um, the company, um, uh, initially considered buying up a bunch of its own stock. Okay, so what I think is interesting about that <clears throat> is stop and think about this. Marymount, now, uh, it, to make a long story short, it turns out that Holland Furnace didn't actually do this. That is, they didn't go into the open market and just buy up a bunch of stock. Instead, they wound up buying Marymount stock from him. They bought it back. Okay, but initially, I, I believe this got edited out of the opinion, initially, um, they toyed with the idea of just buying up some stock from the open market. And I want you to, and that comes up in other cases. It comes up in Unical, for example. And I want to, I want you to think about that. What Marymount wants, uh, if he's going to do a takeover, if he's going to do an unfriendly acquisition, what he wants is a majority of the stock. Uh, every share he can get uh, that gets him closer to um, uh, majority ownership on a percentage basis uh, is, um, serves his interests. If the management buys up shares from third parties, from other shareholders besides Paramount, think about what that does to his share ownership. Say he has 10% uh, of the shares, all right? He's got to get to 50%. And let's just imagine that, in fact, he has a total of 10 shares and the total number of shares outstanding is 100, all right? He's got 10%. Say that the uh, management goes out and buys up uh, as a way to make him go away. They, they want to go out and buy up uh, shares from third parties. And to make the math easy, let's say they go out and they buy 50 shares. Okay? What does that do to Marymount's percentage ownership? He's gone from owning 10 out of 100 to 10 out of 50. So the company, in fact, increased his share ownership. In fact, it doubled it. If they buy 50 out of 100, they doubled it because now he has 20%, uh, even though he, he himself hasn't bought any more shares. Okay, so you might wonder, what are they thinking? They're getting him closer to majority control. And yet we see companies doing this all the time as a defensive measure. And the answer is really pretty simple. You are increasing the person's share percentage, but by uh, essentially giving him competition for the outstanding shares, it, the effect is just supply and demand. You're making the price go up. Sometimes companies do in fact do this. They go out and they buy some shares in the open market um, just to make the price go up to try to scare this person away, to get them to sell off their shares and give up the effort. Okay, well anyway, uh, so they ultimately didn't do that. Instead, the board uh, met in various ways um, the leadership uh, uh, met and they decided that the thing to do would be just to buy uh, the shares back from Marymount himself and make him go away. And indeed, they, uh, the company decided to do that uh, at a premium. Okay, so um, he, here uh, Marymount is doing something that has uh, sort of a colorful little name, a colloquial name in the M&A uh, context. He was engaged. It appears that he was engaged in what we call green mail, and as the as the opinion indicates, he was in fact a person who was known for doing this. Green mail is where you buy up some of the company, uh, some of the stock of a company. You try to scare the management into believing that you're going to get the rest of it, and you um, uh, frighten them into buying you off at a premium. So a nice little investment strategy. So it's very possible that Marymount really never had any intent um, to get control of the company. 
and uh, all he really wanted was this green mail uh, payoff. Anyway, all of that's beside the point. The plaintiffs in this case were was not Marymount, it was shareholders who believed that the company uh, the company's management shouldn't have been allowed to do this. Um, uh, so this is a derivative action by other shareholders of the corporation saying that it was uh, an improper use of the company's assets to buy back Mar Marymount shares at a uh, premium. Okay, so the first thing the court says on page 752 is that, first of all, the company is broadly authorized by statute to do these things. The co uh, companies can buy back their own shares. That's That's plain and that's true in all jurisdictions. Uh, second, there, uh, the court points to case law saying, you can buy back shares uh, selectively. That is, you don't have to buy back shares from all the shareholders or make the opportunity available to all shareholders to sell their shares. Um, you can, in fact, purchase um, shares selectively. Uh, the question then, though, is that the plaintiffs say um, this wasn't just an ordinary corporate action. This wasn't in the ordinary course of this company's business. This was, in fact, a self-interested effort of um, directors of the Holland Furnace Company to keep themselves in office, and that should violate their fiduciary duties. Um, and here the court uh, does, in fact, have some sympathy for the plaintiffs. So first of all, on the bottom of page 752, the court points out that, uh, indeed, there is something like a conflict of interest. There is a tension in the interest between uh, directors and their shareholders when there is a threat of um, takeover. Okay, and here, here's something important to understand. Um, the court draws a distinction between, uh, as we might say, inside directors and outside directors. And for our purposes now, for this hostile takeover context, um, the distinction is very simple. An inside director is a director who also has a job in the corporation. Okay, so any person who's an officer, a CEO, the general counsel, or whatever, uh, who also holds a seat on the board is an inside director. Uh, everybody else is an outside director. Um, the reason this matters is that the court thinks, the Delaware Supreme Court thinks, that inside directors have a much more acute conflict of interest than outside directors do. Um, and you might say, why? I mean, obviously inside directors have a serious conflict of interest if they might lose their jobs. They're going to lose their income. Uh, so they have a direct pecuniary conflict of interest uh, as um, with respect to their own shareholders. The shareholders want takeovers. People who lose their jobs don't. But you might think, well, wait a minute, don't, don't directors get uh, compensation for their jobs? The answer is yes, they do. Typically, directors do, in fact, receive compensation. The thing is, um, it, it's, it pales in comparison to the compensation that a corporate officer usually gets, and nobody really does uh, board uh, service as their sole income. Um, so compensation will tend to be small by comparison to the person's uh, ordinary income. Typically a direct an outside director will have a job as an officer in some other business or as an academic or uh, uh, occasionally in government service. Um, and they, um, uh, you know, they're compensated, but it's a small, a small component of their overall compensation. It's also, uh, board service is also a small component of their overall uh, daily you know, uh, life uh, commitments, uh, you, t you tend to uh, be called for four or six board meetings a year or whatever uh, that may last, um, last a day. All right, so uh, an inside director has a much more serious conflict of interest. Indeed, if you look at the top of page 753, the Delaware Supreme Court makes mention of two of the directors in this case um, who were Mr. Cheff and Mr. Uh, Trendcamp. So Chuff is the CEO of the corporation, so he's plainly an inside director, and Trend Camp is its general counsel. So they both have as their major income uh, employment in this company. And the court says, you know, we would judge their conduct in um, in making Marymount go away. Their conduct in using corporate funds to pay off Marymount to go away. Their conduct is actually judged under um, a special standard. Not this, the new CHEF rule that's announced in this case, but uh, the intrinsic fairness test. They have a conflict of interest, and therefore, uh, if they are challenged separately as defendants, they would be uh, called upon to defend themselves under um, the intrinsic fairness test, meaning they have the burden of proving that their conduct was fair to the corporation. Okay, but the, the real purpose of this case, though, is to introduce um, a new rule that governs the... Um, uh, conduct of outside directors. So when outside directors take action that is defensive, 
um, they and if they're sued for it, they under Chef they would have to defend themselves under the new rule announced in Chef. Now, a couple of qualifications here. First of all, uh, Chef was the law in Delaware for a long time, but it came to be modified later in the Unical case. So, um, Chef is part of the Unical rule. So. Um, once we've talked about Unical, we're going to start calling this thing the Unical rule. Um, okay, but before it was modified in Unical, Chef set out this rule, and we'll talk about that in a second. So that's the first qualification. Second thing is, um, remember I said uh, that this rule applies where um, the outside directors have taken uh, what we might call defensive measures. So that poses a little question. What is a defensive measure? In other words, what is it that triggers application of the Chef rule? And the short answer is, it's really anything that uh, an outside director does with the purpose of entrenching themselves. Anything they do that could discourage an unfriendly takeover. And that turns out to be a very broad category of conduct. So um, all kinds of things that a company might do, um, even when there's no pending takeover, uh, could be subject to uh, what will be called eventually the Unical rule. Um, Okay, so this thing applies, in knowing when this thing applies, the question is not, was there a pending takeover effort? It's, was the action taken with the, uh, with the purpose of um, defending against unwelcome takeover? All right, well, anyway, we'll, we'll see that a little bit uh, later once we get in more deeply into the cases. Um, but the rule the court states is, is straightforward, and it appears on page uh, 753. Um, so let's just uh, uh, write this out on a little chart. Okay, so CHEF is actually only the first of a couple of special fiduciary obligations in hostile takeover that we'll work through. Uh, but let's get it on our chart. So the CHEF rule says that if the plaintiff shows action that is quote-unquote defensive, the burden of proof then shifts to any independent director defendant to show quote good faith and reasonable inv investigation that led to quote reasonable grounds to believe a danger existed to corporate policy and effectiveness. As applied to this case, the court didn't seem too troubled, as, at least as far as the independent directors were concerned. Uh, the court thought that the efforts that they took to um, investigate the presence of Mr. Marymount and the threat that he posed uh, were good faith and reasonable. Uh, namely, the directors like tried to figure out who it was that was buying up this stock. They met with him. They uh, tried to understand his ideas. Uh, they investigated a little bit about who he was. So the investigation that they undertook was good faith and appropriate. Um, and they demonstrated that there were reasonable grounds um, uh, to believe a danger existed to corporate policy and effectiveness. Specifically, Marymount um, uh, was threatening this traditional um, uh, policy under which the company had uh, maintained an in-house sales force and even the mere presence of him uh, uh, in the wings was uh, upsetting um, staff. Okay, so that um, that's Chef. Now, importantly, Chef uh, gets changed in Unical, uh, and then we'll see a special rule applies in some circumstances under the Revlon Doctrine. So we're we're only about halfway there. But before we move on, um, let's talk about a couple of uh, 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 think about this questions that appear on page seven fifty four. Okay, question A: What precisely is it the defendant's burden to show? in a case in which the plaintiff contends entrenchment was the motive for resisting a takeover. Uh, okay, so we, we kind of laid that out. The defendant has to show that they undertook um, a reasonable and good faith investigation that led them to reasonable grounds to believe a danger to corporate policy and effectiveness. Um, if you take a look at page 753, it does specifically say, um, it is. Uh, this is from the uh, third full paragraph, the middle of that short paragraph. It says, it is important to remember that the directors satisfy their burden by showing good faith and reasonable investigation. Okay, so it isn't so much that they have to prove that the threat was real. Uh, they don't have to show that Marymount was, in fact, a danger to the company. They really only have to show that they uh, uh, undertook a good faith and um, uh, reasonable investigation. So they didn't just, uh, you know, uh, approach this lackadaisically or uh, make assumptions or whatever. Um, it's also useful to remember... Oh, uh, the, the next question is, does it make a difference whether he or she is an inside director? We already answered that, and the answer is yes. Uh, okay, question B. What precisely must the plaintiff show in order to win a case based on a claim that the defendants sought to entrench themselves? Um, and here it would be defeating the uh, defendant's demonstration that their investigation was appropriate, and that's really it. So long as their investigation was good faith and reasonable, uh, they will win. Okay, 
So here I'd like to pause for a digression on something that I find completely fascinating. Um, and I hope you do too. I hope this is useful. Um, anyway, like I said, there's a lot in the background of cases like these, cases like Jeff, that help explain the law that aren't necessarily obvious on the surface of the cases. Uh, and in particular, there's a, so, there's a social history. Like, um, there just were certain people. There, for, for one thing, there were certain things that one simply didn't do. One did not take another gentleman's company from him. Um, there also were just sort of certain people who were on the outside. I mean, there was a, a certain class that was uh, common within corporate uh, management and uh, uh, outsiders didn't play much of a role in it. And that was true both in corporate boardrooms themselves uh, and also within the investment banking houses that uh, provided money for the transactions. Okay, so things started to change. Uh, and they started to change not too long after um, uh, Jeff versus Mathis. Um, now there's a particular individual who happens to be important here. He's not mentioned anywhere in this book so far as I'm aware, but he plays a big role. He's, be, he's really behind uh, the background of a lot of the cases we're going to be talking about here. In fact, he is personally involved to one degree or another uh, in each of the cases that uh, follow for a little while. Um, and that person's name is Michael Milken. Uh, so here he is. Uh, Milken was uh, um, an investment banker, um, and he was kind of an outsider. I mean, he was not uh, exactly an inside kind of person. He was, uh, he was a brilliant person. Uh, he's widely acknowledged as a, a, a brilliant uh, financial thinker. He was a, a Wharton School graduate. He was a finance person at the Wharton uh, School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. And even as a student, he was recognized for his, his brilliance. He, had, he discovered certain things and made certain arguments that were influential. Um, here he is. So this is Milken, uh, probably uh, mid-70s, 1974-75. Uh, here he is at the trading desk in the investment banking firm that he worked in called Drexel Burnham Lambert. Uh, so uh, Milken was, um, again, he was not exactly an insider. He wasn't the sort of person who would ordinarily be part of uh, uh, the heart of a uh, great big company or anything like that or a great big investment bank. And indeed, Drexel Burnham was not a great big investment bank. It was a small bank. Uh, just like with uh, people, there were there were outsider investment banks too, and firms like Drexel Burnham, at least up until the time when Milken got there, um, tended to be uh, uh, sort of small and on the outsides as well. Okay, but that's where Milken came in. He came up with something really, really special and important, uh, and uh, it's a term we all know now and take for granted. But uh, Milken invented it, and that was the junk bond. So a junk bond is just like other bonds. It's a debt security. Um, you, uh, a corporation issues a bond as a way of raising money, and a bond is like a little uh, loan contract. Remember, if you sell a debt security, it is effectively um, a, a loan contract under which an investor loans you a certain amount of money and you promise to repay it with interest. The big difference between a debt security and an ordinary loan contract is that typically Debt securities are issued in a large number to a large number of investors, and they're all issued um, under a master loan contract. Um, when they're sold publicly, when bonds are sold publicly, um, they're issued under a master loan contract um, that uh, um, we call an indenture, a uh, trust indenture. And uh, usually the person who oversees the trust indenture um, is like another kind of underwriter, okay? So issuances of debt securities, we, we saw this long ago, but it's worth saying again. Issuances of debt securities are like IPOs of stock. Uh, you hire an investment banker to act as the underwriter of your issuance. That person in, in a debt security transaction is known as um, the indenture trustee because they oversee this master loan contract. But basically the relationship is, is the same. So it, it looks like this. Okay, so this was our structure for how IPOs work. And all we do is change it a little bit so that instead of uh, an underwriter, we refer to the investment bank as the indenture trustee. It oversees a big master loan contract called the um, uh, uh, trust indenture. Um, and in, I've written in here instead of securities uh, that bonds are issued by um, the corporation and sold to the public instead of just securities. Here's the thing, though. Along comes Milken. Uh, and he has a new idea for how to use these bonds to raise money in a somewhat different way. Now, there's nothing about a junk bond that is any different from any other kind of bond. It's just a debt security. Uh, 
They're called junk bonds, though, because they're very, very risky. Junk bonds typically are issued on investments uh, that are very risky and very likely to fail. So a corporation that is uh, undertaking some very risky new endeavor uh, 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 or is brand new but wants to borrow a lot of money or something like that, the kinds of uh, ventures that are pretty likely to fail uh, m might uh, issue junk bonds. Um, in order to get people to invest in something so risky, uh, you got to give them something uh, back, uh, though, something in exchange for all that risk. And so junk bonds uh, tend to pay very, very high interest. So a uh, pretty good rate of interest, uh, depending on, um, you know, federal interest rates and what you can get from a bank, will run like 4 or 5% in a, in a, at a given time uh, on corporate bonds. Uh, junk bonds tend to pay like 17%, 18%. So they pay extremely high um, interest, <clears throat> but they also uh, entail a huge amount of risk. So the odds are you're going to lose your money if you buy junk bonds, um, but you might make a whole lot on the interest. All right, so uh, if Milken uh, um, sold uh, junk bonds um, with, uh, with Drexel Burnham as in debt for trustee, it would look a little bit like this. So the structure is really the same, uh, hardly differs uh, from other bond issuances, and uh, uh, at least in its superficial design, it's all the same. Um, Milken had a special role, so I sort of drew him into the box here. Um, he was a very hands-on guy. He, uh, he ran these transactions, um, and since he's kind of important, let's talk about what exactly he did. So <clears throat> the, the thing Milken did to make the junk bond market come into existence, and he really did single-handedly make this happen uh, and made it into a huge financial juggernaut, was that he preached the gospel of diversification. So, you know, the way I describe junk bonds, you really might wonder who would ever invest in this. You make a big rate of interest, but you're likely to lose all your money because most of these deals uh, become insolvent. Milken said, look, um, that may be true, uh, but diversify. If you're really diversified in a portfolio of highly risky investments, most of which will fail, but some of which pay off handsomely, you actually make more money uh, in the end than you would with uh, an undiversified portfolio or a portfolio of safe investments. And so Milken went out and marketed these crazy junk bonds to this world of investors who all believed in this gospel. Now, these weren't just uh, uh, average Joes. These were, were mostly uh, big institutions and very wealthy people. Um, it just so happens uh, uh, you will have heard of the so-called savings and loan crisis of the 1980s. Well, this was part of it. Uh, a lot of Milken's uh, clients, a lot of his investors on the right-hand side of the picture there uh, happened to be savings and loan entities um, and other financial institutions, uh, entities that um, had money to burn uh, and were relatively unregulated and could invest in these these crazy risky things. Well, uh, so it was very important to Milken to keep this uh, market of potential buyers alive and keep it very liquid and keep it big because with all those investors at his uh, at his command and willing to invest in new issuances that he put together, he could amass big piles of money really fast, like bigger than anybody had ever done before, uh, faster than anybody had ever done before. Um, and he was willing to put it in the hands of people who couldn't have gotten it before. All right, so the kind of person that Milken invested in um, would be people like Marymount, right? Marymount from Chef, outsiders who weren't aren't really... Uh, often invited to the party, uh, and who didn't really matter that much because they couldn't usually put together a big enough pile to actually a pile of money to cause trouble. Um, but all that changed with uh, with uh, Milken. Now suddenly, uh, outsider investors, people willing to believe in this market for corporate control, people willing to believe that society benefits when companies are taken by force away from managers who are inefficient or lazy or incompetent or whatever. Um, those people suddenly could walk in and uh, uh, promise to the members of the board and management of a company that if they didn't engage in a friendly merger negotiation, uh, Michael Milken would raise them a billion dollars over the weekend and, and uh, would take their company away from them. Okay, well, there's more to the story than that, and we'll get to more of the story, but uh, Milken was behind a lot of these cases. So in particular, Milken uh, financed this fella, T. Boone Pickens, who was behind the Unical case, he also financed the guy uh, 
uh, who was the protagonist or antagonist, depending on how you look at it, in the Revlon case, uh, Mr. Ron Perlman. So both these cases were definitely driven by Milken and the gobs of money that he could raise um, in this new junk bond market that he largely uh, created by uh, sheer force of will. All right, well, as, as kind of a postscript, um, it turns out that Milken um, wasn't just doing this entirely on the up and up. That is, he was doing something to keep, uh, keep that big pool of investors there on the right-hand side of the chart uh, interested in buying his investments. Specifically, he was uh, giving them stock tips. So Milken represented lots and lots of big corporate clients. He had lots of extremely valuable secrets that they get, had given him. Uh, and when he was trying to hawk some new uh, bunch of crazy uh, junk bonds, um, he would entice people to invest in them by giving them uh, valuable uh, insider trading tips. Uh, it was a I scratch your back, you scratch mine kind of deal. Uh, and here he is on the courthouse steps not long before he went to prison. Uh, he wound up paying the largest uh, criminal fine in the history of the federal securities laws. And he served a pretty long prison sentence. Um, here he is after he got out of prison. True story. Okay, so that brings us to the case of Unical Corp versus Mesa Petroleum. This is on page 758 in your book. Uh, again, this is a case that uh, even though he's not mentioned in it, uh, Milken was behind it. So um, this is the first of a few cases we're going to see in which really redonkulously huge companies <clears throat> uh, become the targets for takeover by uh, almost laughably small ones. Um, in this particular case, we got Unical, uh, which is still the uh, name we hear of, notwithstanding all the, uh, the mergers and acquisitions in petroleum uh, and the resulting uh, a few firms left standing. But Unical, uh, we all remember as a big company, and indeed it was a multinational publicly traded uh, behemoth. The company trying to take it over here uh, was not. Uh, uh, it was a small entity called Mesa. Uh, Mesa Petroleum actually was a small um, uh, family of little companies, but we're just going to refer to it as, as Mesa. So uh, here, here's how the deal looked. Okay, now importantly, uh, this is described as a two-tier tender offer, and that becomes important to the legal issues later on. So the target firm was Unical, which is a great big publicly traded firm, and it has a group of public shareholders, no controlling shareholder in this firm. Along comes Mesa Petroleum, which is uh, um, a much smaller company, and it desires to buy Unical. All right, so that brings us to another real colorful character in the story, T. Boone Pickens. Now, uh, Pickens had already had quite a career before this case um, as a, a, a financial uh, uh, brinksman, a uh, bit of a financial corporate pirate, uh, in fact, he was kind of like Marymount in that he was a bit of a green mailer. Anyway, he uh, he just so happens to be in charge of Mesa, um, and he is a Milken protege. So Mesa Petroleum, owned and operated by T. Boone Pickens, uh, is financed in this endeavor by Michael Milken and Drexel Burnham Lambert. All right, so um, Mesa had, as often happens in these takeover deals, Mesa had acquired some stock in this company before it proceeded to tender offer. And in particular, it had acquired about 13% of the company by the time uh, this litigation erupted. So Mesa then uh, launches the first tier of its two-tier tender offer. And crucially, uh, the first tier is for cash. So Mesa approaches the public shareholders out there in the world and says, I'll buy your stock up uh, to a certain number so that I uh, acquire 37% of the remaining outstanding shares at $54 in cash. Now, 37 is not a not an arbitrary number, by the way. Mesa already has a little over 13%. If it acquires another 37%, then it's got um, uh, a majority of the company. Okay, so the result, if this were to go forward, is that Mesa would have a little more than 50% of Unical. The public shareholders would then have a little bit less than 50%. That's where the second tier comes in, which is a plan of merger in which Unical will be merged into Mesa. Crucially, however, uh, the public shareholders wouldn't just be exchanging their shares for cash, as had been the case in the first part of the tender offer. Instead, Mesa would issue junk bonds with the help of Michael Milken. Uh, okay, so that's what makes this a two-tier tender offer, and that's what make, made it of acute concern uh, to the management and perhaps to the shareholders as well of Unical. Okay, so what happens next is that when all these facts become aware to the management of Unical, uh, as one, I guess, their uh, 
they're not well they don't welcome this uh, this is a Milken financed uh, notorious green mailer coming knocking on their door uh, making big threats um, <clears throat> and they want to make him go away um, and so interestingly um, they do the thing that I mentioned uh, in the last case and Chef they they do one of these so-called self tenders that is they go out into the open market and they buy a bunch of stock uh, using corporate funds, they buy up a bunch of stock from existing shareholders, but they don't make that available to um, uh, uh, Pickens. Um, and again, you know, you might wonder, well, why are they doing this? Because they're raising his percentage, and the answer is um, is uh, supply and demand. They're trying to make uh, the company cost a little bit more. So in a way, this is a, per, a pretty crude tender offer defense, as as we'll see, especially in the Revlon case. Um, takeover defenses can get uh, a whole lot more sophisticated, a whole lot more complicated than this. Um, uh, uh, but even crude ones can kind of work. Um, all right, so Milken uh, sues. <clears throat> Milken asserts that, I'm sorry, not Milken, uh, Pickens. Pickens sues. So uh, minor question there is you might wonder, where, where's, uh, where does uh, Pickens get off suing? I mean, it seems like he's asserting fiduciary duties. After all, you you challenge these takeover defenses under uh, the fiduciary duties of the outside directors. You allege that it's a violation of the business judgment rule as interpreted and modified in CHEF. Um, but remember, Mesa had, in fact, bought some stock already. Mesa was, in fact, already a Unical stockholder. So uh, Mesa appears here as the, the plaintiff, as a shareholder derivative plaintiff, asserting fiduciary duties against um, the management of Unical, and that's how it often goes. Ten typically, the tender offer proponent will have some stock, and they can challenge takeover defenses um, as shareholder derivative plaintiffs. So um, Pickens uh, says, yeah, this uh, this violates the duty. Um, and up until this time, that duty would have been the duty known in um, in uh, Chef. The Delaware Supreme Court here, though, decides to uh, actually modify this duty a little bit. Um, and you'll, uh, it's worth, uh, it's worth asking why. For one thing, towards the end of the, um, the opinion on page 762, uh, top full paragraph in that page, the court starts uh, talking about how uh, the world has changed since um, uh, Chef. World has gotten more complicated. The court lists a series of uh, of uh, these lingo terms from the world of M and A. Court says, um, more recently, as the sophistication of both raiders and targets has developed, a host of other defensive measures counter uh, to counter ever such mounting threats has evolved. Uh, these include defensive charter amendments and other devices bearing bearing some rather exotic but apt names: Crown Jewel, White Knight, Pac Man, Golden Parachute, etc. All right, so the court's saying, look, this whole world of takeovers, it's getting uh, a lot more active, um, a lot more threatening to existing corporations. Uh, again, Michael Milken isn't mentioned, but uh, a world in which um, financing in very, very large dollar amounts is suddenly available to people to take over corporations, even in the riskiest transactions. Um, that has changed the world, and the courts are taking notice. And the defenses, defensive measures have uh, gotten more sophisticated as well. The corporate managements have gotten very sophisticated in, uh, in attempting to thwart these deals. Um, and so the court decides uh, that this, this needs further attention. Um, another aspect of this deal, another reason uh, that the court was, was particularly concerned about this case and uh, thought maybe it was necessary to modify the existing legal rules, was because of the particular nature of this uh, takeover, this two-tier tender offer. And this is worth uh, stopping to think about just a little bit because this is relevant to what, uh, to the court's legal analysis of um, the, the company's takeover, uh, takeover defense. Um, in particular, the court felt that the threat to corporate policy and effectiveness that the management discovered here was in fact a really severe threat. And, and here's what it is. Remember, um, the deal looked like this. So the first tier was a payment for about half the stock um, in cash, but the second tier, even though nominally the consideration was supposed to be also worth $54, worth just as much as the consideration in the first tier, the consideration being given was junk bonds. So the holders of those bonds were going to hold extremely risky uh, instruments. It might be worth uh, stopping to think for a second about why uh, we might think of those as junk bonds. Like why exactly were the bonds risky? Here's why. Remember, Unical is really big, really big, a multinational. Mesa is really small. Mesa is borrowing a massive amount of money. 
First, it's borrowing the money to pay for the uh, first tier of the tender offer. And then it's effectively borrowing um, the money to buy the, the uh, remaining 50% of the shares in the, two t in the second tier of the tender offer. Um, and it's effectively borrowing that money from the shareholders that it's squeezing out. So in other words, uh, because it's giving them junk bonds, right? Uh, those shareholders will be junk bond holders um, with claims against uh, the Unical company, which is now owned by Mesa. Um, and they will compete for payment of the junk bonds they've been forced to accept in exchange uh, for their shares. Uh, with the creditors who gave Pickens all that money, namely Drexel Burnham, gave um, Pickens all that money to pay for the first tier of the tender offer. So in other words, the entire value of Unical, a massive company, surely many billions of dollars, has been borrowed, at least half of it at extremely high interest, and probably the first tier was also funded with uh, issuance of junk bonds. So billions of dollars borrowed at extremely high interest. Pickens is going to uh, take, he's rolling the dice, he's going to take the bet that he can run Unical so profitably that he's going to be able to pay off the interest at extremely high interest rates on billions of dollars um, during the lifetime of those bonds and not default. So the second tier shareholders would be forced to uh, accept um, debt instruments to be paid for by a company that's suddenly under severe strain and very likely might go into insolvency. Okay, there's a reason for this. The re there's a reason for setting it up as a, as a two-tier deal. All the shareholders know they don't want to get left holding the bag in that second tier. You want to get your shares sold in the first tier when there's $54 in cash, good hard American greenbacks um, that you can get in exchange for your shares. If you can sell all your stock in the first tier, that's a good deal because um, you uh, you will get a nice fat control premium and it's being paid in cash, no risk you're going to lose it. If you're left holding the bag in the second tier, uh, there's a solid chance that you will lose all of your money because you'll be a junk bond holder, uh, a creditor of a firm that's suddenly severely leveraged. Okay, so this is relevant because the Delaware Supreme Court um, took it into, you know, took that seriously as a reason that the management of this company really might try to make t uh, Pickens go away, might take drastic steps to thwart this uh, tender offer. It turns out the, the steps they took weren't even really that drastic. They bought back um, some stock and they excluded Mesa from participating in, in that stock buyback. Um, so uh, Mesa sues. Mesa alleges, first of all, it's inappropriate to buy back stock selectively. We already know under Delaware law that's, that's, uh, that's not a very strong argument. So the more serious question was um, whether there was a violation of the old chef rule. Well, the Delaware Supreme Court says, look, we're, we're just not quite as confident um, as we were back in the day that uh, corporate management should be largely free to thwart takeover deals um, <clears throat> without, uh, without judicial oversight. So the court says, and, and again, this presumably reflects, um, the increasing influence of the old market for co corporate control idea, along with the rise of Michael Milken, the rise in the belief in diversification as sort of a magic solution, the rise of the new finance of the 1970s and 1980s, along with it all came a widely held belief in the market for corporate control. The idea was, you know, if we can use diversification to free up a huge new capital, uh, liquid capital market to fund takeovers, and if takeovers are good for society because uh, the market for corporate control says so, then everything that Michael Milken is doing and everything these raiders funded by him are doing uh, could be great. Uh, could be at least uh, worth uh, worth giving the time of day to. Could could possibly be good. And so the Delaware court seemed to say, well, there is this new belief that all of this might actually be in the in the best interest of companies, in the best interest of society. So we don't want incumbent managers to uh, to have too much freedom to thwart these uh, takeover attempts um, when they get going. And so the court says, we're going to make Chef a little bit tougher. So the Supreme Court, uh, on page 760, um, 760 of your book, uh, adds something to Chef. Um, so as I said earlier, the Chef rule really ultimately became something else uh, as it was modified by Unical, and so it is now uh, really known as the Unical rule. So here's how the Unical rule works. Okay, so first of all, we take the old Chef rule, we rename it Unical, and make Chef the first element of it, and then we add the second element. Um, so element number one, the burden of proof then shifts to independent directors to show good faith and reasonable investigation. That led to reasonable grounds to believe that a danger exists to corporate policy and effectiveness. That's Chef. 
uh, renamed uh, Unical element number one. Unical element two, the action taken must be reasonable in relation to the threat posed. And that's where the two-tier nature of this thing comes in. Um, as the court says, um, there was a very legitimate reason for the Unical board to believe, uh, first of all, that um, Pickens was posing an extremely dangerous proposal for this company. He was going to take a, sort of a healthy, existing, uh, thriving, big company and basically uh, buy it the entire thing on debt, saddle the entire thing with billions and billions of dollars of high interest debt, increasing the risk dramatically that it would go insolvent. Um, so that's, that's kind of bad enough. But second, the two-tier nature of the deal uh, would very possibly pressure lots of shareholders to buy into this to the first tier uh, without giving it much thought. There's such a great risk that they would be stuck holding uh, crappy junk bonds that they might sell in the first tier without really uh, making a reasonable judgment. And remember, all Pickens really needed was the first tier because once he's got majority of the, uh, of the company, um, that's enough to force uh, to force a merger uh, in the second tier, um, <clears throat> regardless what the remaining minority shareholders want. So the court says, in light of those circumstances, um, first of all, the first element, the CHEF element, uh, Unical step number one, was satisfied. There was, a there was a sufficiently reasonable and good faith investigation. Second, there was in fact a serious threat to corporate policy and effectiveness. Um, and that goes to Unical element number two. And that's a balancing test. So you have to ask, well, what was the threat that you found? Um, and given the, the threat that you found, was the step that you took reasonable in relation to it? If this, you know, you have to ask, well, was the defensive measure really, really drastic or was it just not, not very drastic? And whatever you decide about that, you ask, well, given how drastic it was, was it reasonable in light of the threat posed? Since the threat posed to the company was really very serious here, um, the courts presumably would have been willing to tolerate a relatively drastic defensive measure. And as it happens, the measure taken in this case uh, wasn't that uh, serious. Um, so the deal passes muster. Okay, well, that brings us then to a new topic. Unical and Chef are relatively straightforward. Whenever uh, a company takes a step that could be perceived as a defensive measure, uh, it's, uh, it is uh, subject to Unical analysis. It could be challenged uh, by a shareholder derivative plaintiff in a Unical case. Um, uh, and that's relatively straightforward. Um, a different case is posed um, by uh, situations like the next case we're going to talk about, the Revlon case. So Revlon is a, a fair bit more complex um, <clears throat> in its details. We, we shortened the uh, edited version of the opinion because uh, the, the facts get really extremely um, dense. But the basic lesson in the Revlon case is um, that as far as the Delaware Supreme Court is concerned, there can come a point at which uh, the management of a corporation facing the possibility of a takeover should no longer be allowed to make the judgments um, that uh, cor corporations are permitted to make under the Unical rule. That is, Unical is a recognition by the courts that corporate managements still get to make the decision <clears throat> about, uh, still get to make decisions about the long-term future of the corporation. Um, if you stop and think about it, every time uh, the management in a corporation takes action to stop a takeover, assuming that any control premium is available at all, which it almost always is, if the management takes steps <clears throat> to stop the deal, uh, to scare off a tender offer, a proponent, or whatever, um, that management is making the judgment that a quick, short-term payoff for the shareholders, which typically will be quite desirable to those payoff, uh, shareholders, um, it isn't in the best interest of the company. In other words, as long as you're still in Unical world, you're not in Revlon world yet, uh, corporation managements retain the power to decide um, what is in the best long-term interest of the corporation, even if it's at odds with the short-term profit interests of some of the shareholders. Okay, the point of that is Revlon says there can come a point in time at which the corporation doesn't get to do that anymore. Uh, when that point is hit, that so-called that so Revlon moment, 
the moment at which the Revlon duty attaches, the corporation can no longer, uh, that is the management, can no longer even care about future policy. It's just not, uh, not in that um, group's responsibility anymore to care about the long-term future of the corporation. And the only thing they can do um, is get the best, uh, get the highest price for the shareholders they can from some, uh, some bidder. Okay, so the hard thing about Revlon is figuring out when that moment occurs, and we're gonna have to we're gonna have to think about a few different cases uh, to figure that out. Okay, so let's talk about Revlon. All right, now in talking about this case, I'm probably a little self indulgent because I just happen to really love this case and the background to it. Um, if anybody's interested in further reading, there's a, a fantastic book that's about this case in essence. It's called uh, The Predator's Ball by Connie Bruck. Uh, she's a great uh, journalist who uh, dug really deeply into the facts. Um, the reason that the book is so great and the case is so interesting is kind of once again, in keeping with this theme, uh, the uh, Revlon case, just like the overall takeover boom in the 1980s, was really populated by very big, colorful uh, characters. Um, all right. Anyway, one of the biggest uh, personalities in this whole story was the fellow who uh, was behind the effort to take over um, Revlon, and that was the chairman and CEO of the Pantry Pride firm um, and another uh, uh, Milken protege, as it happens, a man who was uh, financed by um, uh, junk bond money raised by Michael Milken, and that was uh, this fella, Ron Perlman. Now, when I say Ron Perlman, I'm not talking about this guy. Star of TV's iconic and beloved Beauty and the Beast? No, I'm talking about this guy. Okay, well, there's one final big personality in this story, and that is the incumbent CEO of Revlon, Michel Bergerac. All right, so Bergerac was a Frenchman, and he was uh, very much an establishment uh, corporate uh, finance titan type of person. Uh, he'd run Revlon for about a decade before Perlman came on the scene. Uh, he largely embodied Revlon and its success. Well, there's another aspect of this whole story that I've glossed over a little bit, even though we've made reference to the social history that lies in the background. Uh, but it's harder to avoid once you get to the Revlon case. It's not mentioned in the opinion, but it's certainly, surely part of the story as told by most people who, who've told the story, including uh, emphatically uh, Connie Bruck in her great book, Predator's Ball. And that is that there was, um, there was a class, uh, racial, and gender aspect to these stories. Um, and in particular, Michelle Bergerac and his board, uh, by all accounts, were not very fond of people like uh, Perlman uh, or people like... Uh, uh, Milken, and it wasn't just because they were outsiders, it was also because they were Jewish. Uh, so times were changing, corporate boardrooms were opening up to a more diverse um, uh, range of uh, uh, participants, and um, uh, that is part of the opposition uh, to the Perlman bid, or so it appears. Here's a great story from PBS NewsHour for anybody who's interested. Um, Connie Brock, for what it's worth, uh, she loved pointing out that whenever uh, Perlman would go see Bergerac in his office. Uh, um, she would describe him as a short, fat, bald little man, always smoking a cigar, who would put his feet up on Bergerac's antique desk and tip out the ashes of his cigar on his uh, precious oriental rug. So whatever may have been the other uh, uh, animosities or prejudices or whatever they were, I wouldn't have any idea. I don't know the inside of Michelle Bergerac's heart, but there's no doubt that the two men were from different worlds and they did not like each other. Okay, so those are the major players in the story. Uh, now let's look at uh, the facts of the case. So um, let's get out uh, the basic relationships of the parties. Uh, it gets a little bit complicated, so let's uh, do a little drawing. Okay, so in the story of Revlon versus McAndrews and Forbes, uh, we start with Revlon, which is a great big publicly held corporation. Its uh, CEO, as we saw, is Michelle Bergerac, and it has a large number of dispersed outside shareholders, uh, no controlling shareholder. Onto the scene comes this firm, Pantry Pride, a much smaller company. Uh, as an indication of what sort of man Michelle Bergerac was, according to Connie Brook, he always referred to it as Panty Pride. Anyway, uh, as we saw, Ron Perlman was its chairman and CEO. Let's remember, though, uh, Perlman and Pantry Pride were not in this uh, alone. They had with them the assistance of Drexel Burnham and Michael Milken. And let's remember what uh, Milken proposed to do for people like Perlman. He went out to uh, a group of uh, investors and sold them junk bonds and raised a whole bunch of money real fast. 
that money was uh, funneled through Drexel Burnham as the indenture trustee and then given to Pantry Pride uh, for its use in corporate transactions. All right, now while this money is being put together and other steps are being taken in preparation for Pantry Pride to take a run at Revlon, uh, Perlman makes initial overtures to uh, Bergerac attempting to put together a friendly deal, as one does. Uh, but these things fell through. Uh, no friendly deal was in the offing. Again, it was very unlikely any such thing could have happened given Bergerac's views um, uh, and presumably the views of his board as well. And so Pantry Pride then made its hostile offer and opened up with a $45 cash tender offer for the shares of Revlon Incorporated. All right, so a few things start happening at that point. Um, the board and management of Revlon are uh, pretty alarmed by all this. Uh, they want to make it stop, and so they adopt um, uh, defensive measures. And they are advised by uh, very fancy outside um, counsel and outside investment bankers. We'll get to that in a second. Um, <clears throat> and they put together a couple of uh, initial defensive measures. Um, this stuff gets a little bit complicated, so we're going to dig into it in more detail. First of all, they do a defensive measure that in and of itself isn't that complex. On the top of page 764, you'll notice that the board, uh, on the advice of their investment banker, uh, decided to do uh, what they call a self-tender. Okay, so we've seen this a few times already. This happened in Unical. Uh, it was initially discussed in the Chef case. A self-tender is just when the company goes out and buys up some of its own uh, stock. Uh, in this case, uh, Revlon decided to buy up kind of a, a big chunk of it. Um, they ultimately wound up buying 10 million out of 30 million outstanding shares. So again, this is a little Brinks Brinksman-like. I mean, this is uh, single-handedly increasing uh, Perlman's uh, percentage ownership, uh, reducing the number of shares he still has to get in order to um, to take over the company. Uh, but again, the idea is uh, just to make the price go up. Okay, so all of that said, though, uh, this particular self defend, uh, excuse me, self tender, was more complicated than that because um, Revlon didn't just buy up its own stock with cash. Instead, it bought up um, 10 million shares by issuing, uh, as as they're described in the case, notes. Okay, so in other words, debt securities. Uh, these are like bonds, the things we usually call bonds, whatever. They're just debt securities. But um, Revlon itself issued bonds to uh, 10 million out of 30 million shareholders to buy up their shares. Okay, so this is a little bit more complicated than just buying up your own stock because, again, this is an effort <clears throat> to um, make the company more difficult to buy. And let's stop and think about what exactly Revlon accomplished by doing this. Um Suddenly, a substantial amount of money has been spent um, by the company uh, to buy up stock, and the company is now obligated to repay that money, um, to repay the money that it effectively just borrowed from its own shareholders, okay? So a substantial amount of debt has been taken on, and we're told that these notes uh, are paying a high rate of interest and they have a short mat maturity date, okay? The purpose of doing that is... Um, it is a kind of a crude defensive measure, really. If if Perlman gets control of the company, he suddenly bought a company that now is more expensive to run. It has a big debt obligation. That's going to be piled on top of the already crushing debt burden that um, Pantry Pride would bear um, because of all the money that it raised for the for the takeover um, through uh, through its junk bond financing. Okay. Um, this first offensive measure that the board undertook is kind of important to the case um, in other respects, too, because uh, as the court points out there on the top of page 764, uh, the notes were issued uh, with covenants. In other words, contractual promises to the debt holders saying that um, the company would be uh, would not take on uh additional debt and it wouldn't take certain other actions without the approval of its outside directors. Okay, so there's a promise to the bondholders, uh, we're going to protect your interests, uh, we're going to try to make sure that we remain solvent and we can repay your bonds um, uh, by restricting ourselves from taking on debt or doing other things. Okay, this is important because later on there's an indication that the board members were uh, taking certain actions here, not so much because they thought it was in the interest of the company, but because they wanted to protect those bondholders. And the real reason they wanted to protect the bondholders is not because they liked them or they preferred them over the other shareholders, uh, 
but because they were afraid, the directors were afraid that if they didn't protect the bondholders and didn't preserve the, sh the trading value of the bonds, those bondholders would sue them. Okay, and as the court points out, that is an inappropriate motivation for um, a director. A corporate fiduciary can't uh, make a decision pr to protect themselves from getting sued when that decision is at odds with the interests of the corporation. Um, okay, well, anyway, there was another thing the board did in its initial moves, um, and that requires us to give just slightly more thought to what's going on here. Um, the corporation did what is described as a poison pill. So this is one of those many terms from the sort of modern M&A slang that uh, first arose in the 1970s and 1980s. We uh, set out a bunch of definitions in the book on page 755 and 56. Um, most of them aren't hugely important. Those are mostly uh, for your benefit. One of them that we should know a little bit in more detail is this thing called the poison pill. So the poison pill was a legal strategy devised with the, deep within the innards of this famous New York law firm called Wachtell, Lipton, Rosen, and Katz, and specifically by its uh, named partner, Marty Lipton. Keeping with the theme of big and colorful personalities that were so characteristic of the, the takeover boom in the 1980s, um, Lipton was, um, he was uh, the great hero of a, uh, traditional establishment corporate boards and executives. He was the guy who came to their aid in the new era of uh, corporate raiders, and um, he was extremely clever in coming up with ways to keep uh, uh, corporations in the hands of their, their incumbent management, um, despite whatever machinations the raiders might come up with, and the poison pill was sort of his crowning invention. Wachtell Lipton was also notorious for the amount of money it made. Uh, turns out being able to help corporate managements defend themselves from takeover was, uh, was a very lucrative business. I myself was a young associate um, <clears throat> during the uh, uh, 1990s, and I can remember Wachtell Lipton was the place you, uh, you really wanted to go if you wanted to get rich. Their annual bonuses uh, for even brand new associates were in the six figures, um, and the firm made uh, many, many millions of dollars on the takeover business. So we give a definition of this phrase, poison pill, in the book, but it's, um, it's very general. Uh, we say, and it's, it's true, that it's, it's any provision, which could be in the Articles of Corporation or the bylaws adopted by the board, uh, could be some sort of contract arrangement between the board and shareholders or other people. Um, but the practical effect, the thing that's always true in a poison pill, is that it will be triggered by a takeover attempt. So when, when one person or uh, who may be specified in, in the poison pill or, uh, or any person acquires a certain um, specified number of shares, that will trigger some effect, and the effect will always be to make the, the company either much more expensive to uh, buy or somehow uh, much less valuable to the takeover proponent. Um, okay, so let's talk about the specific poison pill in the Revlon case. So here's how it worked. The thing was called uh, the Note Purchase Rights Plan. This is described on page 764 in the first full paragraph. Um, <clears throat> the um, uh, uh, thing appears to have been adopted as a board resolution, um, and it provided that uh, for every share of common stock, um, uh, the company would issue um, this right, which is just a piece of paper. It was like a little contract. Um, and every person who received that, which would be uh, every shareholder, you got one of these for every share you owned, uh, you would get the right to exchange that share um, for uh, a note, a different note, right? A uh, different set of debt securities than the ones that the company had issued in its self-tender. Uh, these notes, again, uh, would pay a very high percent of interest and have a very short maturity. So again, it would saddle the company with a huge amount of debt. And remember, this was for all the shareholders, like all the remaining shares would be converted into um, uh, uh, expensive debt securities, essentially junk bonds, um, that Revlon would have to pay. Um, so, you know, uh, if this thing were triggered and uh, Perlman wound up getting the company with this thing in place, uh, he would have borrowed several billion dollars in junk bonds and have, uh, have to pay that back. And then suddenly he would have to add to it several billion more in uh, high interest junk bonds that he would have to pay to the former shareholders of um, Revlon. Okay, so this thing is a, a poison pill, though, because it's triggered like it's not automatic. It's only triggered if somebody gets a certain percentage of the company and specifically 
uh, they provided that the trigger would be uh, that if any person acquired 20% of the company, um, then the note purchase rights plan would kick into effect. Okay, so um, the court, uh, at this point, we've got a couple of defensive measures um, on the table, and the court um, uh, addressed these initial two defensive measures in actually a relatively traditional manner. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and we'll get to that in a second, but that wasn't the end of the case. The Revlon board and Pantry Pride kept at it. They kept up a, a, a hostile fight with each other. Um, and the Revlon board did some other things that the court thought had to be analyzed somewhat differently. And this is where the court, uh, it, it is with respect to those additional defensive measures that the court invented the so-called Revlon duty. Okay, so what happened next? After uh, the adoption of the notes purchase rights plan, um, Pantry Pride increased its offer. So an all cash, all tenders, uh, all cash, all shares uh, tender offer was made at a higher price, first at $50, later at $53. As uh, bidding increased, uh, it, it got higher than that. Ultimately, Pantry Pride was offering as much as $56. Um, uh, and the board took act under a lot of pressure. Obviously, if somebody's going to keep raising their price, eventually they're going to convince the shareholders to sell. Um, uh, and the Revlon board um, then took steps to try to stave this off, uh, further, uh, further in yet more desperate steps. So several things happened. We don't really have to dig into all the details, but let's talk about just some of them. First of all, um, the board of directors were told uh, on page 764 on October 3rd, 1983, this is a significant date because this is probably about when the Revlon duty was triggered um, in retrospect. Um, on that day, the board of directors authorized management to seek a third party buyer. Okay, this is significant because as the court later tells us, when the company itself recognizes that the company is going to be sold, then the Revlon duty is triggered. The board can no longer concern itself with the long-term future of the company. It simply has to find the best buyer. Okay, well, um, the major effort that uh, uh, Revlon then undertook was to negotiate with another firm, uh, a so-called private equity firm called Forceman Little, um, which is a private entity with a whole lot of money that uses its money to buy up other companies and run them. And Forceman Little was sought as an alternative buyer to uh, Perlman. You might wonder uh, why, like if it's if the company is going to be sold and everybody knows it, why does the management care anymore? Like why would the board seek out an alternative buyer um, if they're going to be sold and everybody's going to lose their jobs or whatever? Why not just uh, let let yourself be sold? And the answers could be a few, um, but generally speaking, and it definitely is the case uh, here. It, it appears when management, uh, the incumbent management of a company seeks out an alternative buyer in this way. And we there's a there's an M&A lingo term for this. This is called looking for a white knight. All right, Forceman became the white knight in this case. When you go out and look for a white knight, it's generally because the management is afraid of something and they think the white knight will will treat them better than or, or will solve some problem uh, better than the original hostile tender offer or so in this case, it may have been at least initially that management thought, well, if we can get Forceman to buy us out, we can each keep our jobs. At least some of us can keep our jobs. Um, as matters evolved, management was actually squeezed out. By the end, Forceman had agreed with them that they would all uh, quit. But importantly, what management seemed particularly concerned about was, again, those notes, the very initial pile of notes that they issued in the, um, the self-tender. And Forceman promised to make sure that it would take care of the note holders and keep the value of those notes up. Okay, this was very this was important to the court because that is an improper consideration for a fiduciary to take. Note note holders are protected by uh, the contractual rights they have in the trust indenture, right? The master loan contract under which the notes are issued, and that's the only um, those, those are the only rights they have. They don't have rights as the beneficiaries of fiduciary duties. And so the board protecting in, um, themselves from suit by the note holders was was inappropriate. <clears throat> um, all right. Well, anyway, negotiations proceed with Forceman uh, 
And a number of things are done to make sure that Forceman uh, is advantaged and will be able to uh, keep control, notwithstanding Pantry Pride's uh, efforts to uh, continue the hostile effort. Uh, there were a number of specific steps taken. Uh, for one thing, there's a so-called lockup agreement under which Revlon agreed to sell an asset to Forceman Little, uh, uh, a big uh, a big division, a very valuable division of the Revlon company was going to be sold to Forceman at a discount, uh, a discount of like a couple of hundred million dollars, even in the event that someone else acquired the company. That, that again, is a little bit like a poison pill, right? Um, it's a way to make Revlon, the target, less valuable to a person like Perlman, if in fact he gets the company and uh, make it less able to satisfy all that debt service that he's going to have to uh, comply with to pay off the junk bonds. Um, Forceman also got uh, Revlon to agree to a so-called no-shop uh, clause, uh, which says that the target company cannot uh, negotiate with other potential buyers. And there was a cancellation fee of $25 million, which in the broader scheme of things is is pennies. I mean, it, that wasn't a serious, um, a serious uh, dissuasion, presumably, to, uh, to take over. But anyway, so they agreed to a number of provisions that would make it more difficult for a third party to get Revlon. Um, meanwhile, Pantry Pride, knowing of all these things, uh, is doing two things. First of all, Pantry Pride is continually increasing the price at which it will offer shares to, uh, or offer to buy shares from the shareholders, uh, which presumably puts a lot of pressure on the board of Revlon, right? All those shareholders are calling up and saying, why aren't you guys letting us take this big, sweet pay up? But more importantly, uh, Perlman uh, is going to court. Now, remember, when a person does a hostile takeover, they usually will have bought some of the company's shares before the actual tender offer is made. And um, they therefore can sue as, as shareholder derivative plaintiffs, and, and Perlman does that here. So Perlman is in court alleging that these defensive measures are in violation of the director's fiduciary duties and seeking to enjoin them. And indeed, the Court of Chancery uh, enjoins some of them, and the Supreme Court affirms. Okay, so let's look at the legal analysis by which the court handles all these things, the Delaware Supreme Court, that is. Now, remember I said the first two defensive measures were treated differently than the later measures. The first two defensive measures were the initial note rights purchase plan. I'm sorry, forget that. I said that wrong. The initial self-tender, which was purchased with an issuance of notes. That was defensive measure number one. Defensive measure number two was the note purchase rights plan, the so-called poison pill. Um, <clears throat> the court says, look, those are going to be judged just under the traditional Chef Unical rule. Okay. So in other words, the only question with respect to those two um, uh, uh, defensive measures are our familiar um, chef considerations, which um, let's just remember, refresh ourselves what they were. So to defend themselves under the Unical rule, the independent directors of Revlon will have to show that um, uh, they did a good faith and reasonable investigation and discovered reasonable grounds to believe that a danger existed to corporate policy and effectiveness. In this case, that's actually quite simple. And the Delaware Supreme Court, even though they ultimately rule against the defendants here, uh, they agreed. So on the top of page 764, the court says, look, there, there plainly was a risk to the company. Uh, the initial tender offer price was grossly inadequate. It was $45. It, uh, later, it was increased by uh, uh, more than 20%. Uh, moreover, Perlman po uh, proposed taking over a massive company with junk bond financing. The odds were that he would break up the company to be able to pay for it. Um, and even, uh, even in the best case scenario, he would be under uh, immense pressure to meet all that debt service with whatever revenues Revlon was able to um, generate. So uh, the risks of Revlon were, were very, very serious. Um, and there's no question that the board did a good faith and reasonable investigation to determine them. Okay, but then the second question under Unical is whether the action taken was reasonable in relation to the threat posed. Um, and that's harder here because, after all, this, this board did some really drastic things. Uh, they bought 10 million shares with high interest notes. That's pretty radical. And then they adopted um, a poison pill that um, uh, would make the company unviable, in essence. The, they adopted a legal defense that would make it so that no one would ha uh, have bought this company. Um, uh, if, uh, if that poison pill, uh, note purchase rights plan were in place. Um, and so that's quite drastic. Uh, 
Um, but the court said it was actually appropriate in this case. All right. So the first two um, elements, or, or I'm sorry, the first two defensive measures uh, the court held were in fact consistent with the um, the fiduciary duties of the uh, outside directors under the UNICAL um, rule. And bear in mind, we, we said uh, all along in the Chef case and in, in UNICAL itself, we said um, if inside directors take part in defensive actions, their conduct can be judged under uh, the regular old duty of loyalty, and they will be subject to the intrinsic fairness test. Um, but that's easy to avoid. Um, co uh, companies simply appoint committees of independent directors to handle these things. Okay, well that then leaves us with uh, the remaining defensive measures, which were uh, the various agreements that Revlon made with Forceman Little to make it very difficult for Forceman, uh, I'm sorry, for Pantry Pride to um, get the company once Forceman uh, was on the scene. <clears throat> Um, and here the Supreme Court, the Delaware Supreme Court says this is no longer UNICAL territory. Some things changed by the time Forceman Little was on the scene. And the court believes that a new duty uh, is required. Okay, so turning to page 766, the first full paragraph under uh, header 2D, the court says things changed. Specifically, the court says, when Pantry Pride increased its offer to $50 per share and then $53, it became apparent to all that the breakup of the company was inevitable. Moreover, the board's authorization permitting management to negotiate a merger or buyout with a third party was a recognition that the company was for sale. Okay, so something happens when a company is, quote, recognized to be for sale or, quote, the breakup of the company is inevitable. Um, okay, as we're going to see, it's a little bit harder to know when that point occurs than it might seem from a case like Revlon, and we've got to read a couple more cases to understand it um, better. But what's not unclear is what happens um, once that once that moment occurs, okay? The duties of the outside directors change, and here's what the court says. The duty of the board had then changed from the preservation of Revlon as a corporate entity to the maximization of the company's value at a sale for the stockholders' benefit. This significantly altered the board's responsibilities under the UNICAL standards. It no longer faced threats to corporate policy and effectiveness or to the stockholders' interests. Okay, that's pretty significant. The court is saying, look, you just once the once the Revlon moment occurs, you just don't get to even care about the future of the company anymore. It's not your problem. Your only your only goal is to get the best money. Um, uh, and the court continues, the whole question of defensive measures at that point become moot. The director's roles change from directors. Uh, defenders of the corporate bastion to auctioneers charged with getting the best price for the stockholders at a sale of the company. Okay, so um, with that in mind, basically nothing the company did at that point was consistent with its duties because it adopted a number of quite drastic defensive measures to make sure that Forceman Little would get this company and Pantry Pride would not. And that was all very inappropriate. It really was just icing on the cake that the directors, according to the court, were really mainly concerned with their own risks of being sued by the note holders. Um, even if that weren't true, they would have violated their duties. Okay, just to clarify, adopting significant defensive measures uh, that that um, that shut down uh, a bidding war, that shut down the market test uh, uh, for sale of a company, will violate the Revlon duty, uh, no matter what. It was just icing on the cake that the directors were also protecting their their own um, their own selves from. Um, legal liability. Okay, so an interesting question is, once Revlon is triggered, what can you do? Like, what can independent directors do um, to control takeovers? Are they supposed to just do nothing? Do they have to remove all defensive measures? And the answer is no, because uh, defensive measures can still be useful in an auction process. If a company is for sale and there's a bidding war going on, it's still useful for um, the directors of the company to have some sort of defensive measures in place that keep the company from being sold to just anybody who can get uh, get uh, shareholders to tender their shares. Um, but it's pretty clear that those defensive measures have to be waivable by the board um, so the board has to be able to um, uh, allow a purchase to go forward once it finds a desirable bidder. Um, uh, otherwise, they will uh, be scaring off um, uh, desirable competition for the value of the company's stock. Okay, so that's Revlon, a complicated case, um, an important little rule. Um, let us uh, let us add it now, though, to our 
our uh, chart listing the uh, special fiduciary duties that apply in takeover context, because after all, there are two. There's not just Unical, there is now Revlon. All right, so the Revlon rule is that when, quote, breakup of the company becomes inevitable and the company is for sale, the duty of the board changes from preservation of the corporate entity to the maximization of the company's value as a sale for the shareholder's benefit. Okay, so we only have one last thing to talk about for this video, and that is a case called Paramount Communications versus Time Incorporated, which appears on page 770 in your book. Um, in the interest of time, because this has gotten really long, um, I'm going to just talk about this one quickly. There's really only one important thing we need to learn from this case, which is that it tells us something important about how to know when the Revlon duty applies. Um, okay, so he here's what happened. Um, initially, two venerable old media companies were engaged in uh, a friendly uh, merger negotiation. They were going to merge. The two companies were going to be consolidated into a, a surviving entity that would combine the shareholders and the management of the two the two companies uh, into one. And um, the two companies were Time Incorporated, uh, publisher of magazines and books and so on, um, and Warner Music. <clears throat> so. Uh, uh, an important fact that was relevant to the legal issues uh, in the case is that the company, the management of the Time entity considered it very important to protect their flagship product, Time magazine. And in particular, they needed to protect its perception, the public, uh, the public perception of its uh, editorial independence. It was a serious journalistic uh, effort. And there was a lot of concern that combining with this media company um, might uh, might damage that value. So within the company, there was something known as the quote unquote time culture, the time culture, which was the sense that the magazine was uh, editorially independent. Uh, it was important in putting this deal together that the time culture be preserved. And that was done in various ways. The time entity would have uh, a greater say in management, uh, more more spots on the board, etc. Um, okay, well, in the course of things. An interloper uh, came on the scene, and that was Paramount Communications. Uh, Paramount was a, obviously a competing media entity, competes directly with Warner. This appears to have been a time when uh, media entities all over the place were trying to merge and, and uh, uh, conglomerate uh, to add lots and lots of diverse uh, kinds of media uh, businesses within them. Uh, and both, uh, both Warner and uh, Paramount um, decided they might like to get a hold of Time Magazine and its uh, its book publishing and other businesses. So uh, Paramount announces a um, an uh, unfriendly bid uh, in cash for the shares of Time. Uh, this alarms the management of Time as it always does, but in particular, um, the management at Time was afraid that um, shareholders would be too enticed by the desirable price at which Paramount sought to buy their shares, and they wouldn't think carefully, they wouldn't care about the future of the value of Time Magazine. They wouldn't protect the Time culture. Okay, this is really important to understand because this highlights the difference between a Unical case and a Revlon case. Remember, the defendants in this case win. That is, they adopted defensive measures, and in the face of fiduciary challenge, the court said, no, those defensive measures were appropriate. Um, and indeed, the defensive measures here were very, very drastic. Um, this is important because if this had been a Revlon case, adopting defensive measures to protect the long-term value of the time culture would have been inappropriate. You're not allowed to do that when you're a director in a company facing um, takeover under Revlon circumstances. You can only do that when it's still a Unical case. All right? Let me say that again. Let me rephrase that. If it's still... A Unical case, if you're still in Unical world, you can, in fact, scare off, prevent um, a, a takeover effort, even if the price at which the takeover proponent is willing to buy the shares is very desirable, very high. You can scare it off if, in your view, as a corporate director, you think uh, it is not in the best interest of the company as a long-term matter. Okay. Um, the uh, uh, negotiators for um, uh, uh, the initial deal between Time and Warner, um, even before Paramount was on the scene, 
they adopted some um, defensive measures. These were limited. Uh, they they got commitment letters from a number of banks that uh, saying that they wouldn't finance alternative bidders. Um, they got a small breakup fee. They did a few other things. What's important, and the court says, you know, all of that is consistent with Unical. Uh, those were deal protection measures or defensive measures that were meant to keep third parties from buying the company. Um, what's important about that is that um, um, the this is our first indication, our first clear authority for the following rule. Unical applies to any defensive measure, whether there's a pending takeover or not, okay? When the Time and Warner negotiators um, agreed to these deal terms, they um, there was no pending uh, takeover effort. Paramount was not on the scene. Nobody else was trying to get the company. This was just a deal protection measure put in place um, uh, just in case there might be some uh, attempt by a third party. Okay, and the court says, well, that's Unical. Unical applies because those are defensive measures. The court does say, though, that uh, those measures were um, were uh, 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 appropriate under Unical. Okay, well, uh, once Paramount is on the scene, though, the company decides to take substantially more radical um, defensive measures. And specifically, they do a great, great, great big defensive measure, which is that time agrees simply to buy Warner. Um, time is going to do a, t uh, uh, a merger in which it will cash out the Warner shareholders entirely, and Warner will be a subsidiary of Time. You might say, why is that a defensive measure? If it's a defensive measure for the simple reason that once Time has acquired Warner, it would be a much, much, much more expensive uh, target to buy, and there's no chance that Paramount could have could have acquired it. Okay, so the big question in the case, though, is uh, why isn't that... Um, why isn't that a Revlon case? Like, why hasn't uh, Time agreed that uh, the company is for sale? A breakup is inevitable. The court says it's not. All right, and let's stop and think about this. The reason is really very simple, um, and it is this. Nothing had happened during Time's consideration of this purchase of Warner or any of the changes in its planning that acknowledge the board's, you know, represented the board's acknowledgement that time was for sale. Time was still going to be, uh, after this transaction with Warner, in which Warner would become a time subsidiary, wholly owned, um, uh, time, uh, time's board would still be in charge. Uh, time was not relinquishing its own, um, uh, its own control. And most importantly, time would continue with the same ownership structure that it had before. All right, this is important because this distinguishes this case from the next one, which we're going to talk about in the next video. Time would time before the deal, uh, before its deal with Warner would be, uh, was a uh, publicly traded company with a dispersed uh, body of, of independent shareholders. There was no controlling shareholder. After its deal with Warner, that would still be true. It would still be a publicly traded company. Um, and so Time had not acknowledged that its breakup was inevitable, had not put itself up for sale. And nobody else could say at that point that it obviously was going to be broken up. Um, okay, so that's Time and Warner. And that's it for today. That was a long one. Sorry, uh, sorry it went on so long, but I hope that was good. I tried to keep it a little bit lively, and I hope you learned a lot. See you next time.